your age. Oh, well, he's not a little bit. Sucks. So, where were we, John? So, I want to, so, I guess the next major chapter of your life I know is going to Israel, meeting Galit. You met Galit in Boston? Yeah, well, no, I met Galit, I went to the Red Sea one summer. I went to hear Jacques Cousteau speak in Harvard, and I asked him where I should go, and he said, my happiest hours have been spent beneath the waters of the Red Sea. Huh. So, a few months later, summer vacation, that's the beauty of teaching there, and I was off to the Red Sea to photograph in this uh, famous of places uh -huh. that was in Israel, and uh, Galit came down to take a diving course, and that's where we met. She was like 18 or 19? She was uh, almost 20. She was still 19. She was in her final year at the university. And you were how old? I was seven years old, 27. And you met her at the diving course itself? Well, I was working, I was diving out of this dive club where she was taking a course to learn how to scuba dive. Where was Scuba this? diving had become very popular since Israel took um, Sinai, uh, took Sinai. Yeah, I mean, here was one of the best places in the world to dive. Where was this dive club? In Elat. Um, and then you guys married. She moved to America, or no? No, she came uh, to graduate school. And we lived together for three years. Where did she go to graduate school? In Tufts. And she said, oh, man, I miss Israel too much. I want to go back. And I said, okay, let's go back and get married. And, and I'll stop teaching and become an underwater photographer. <laughs> I did it. Uh -huh. I had no other choice. I mean, what was I going to do in Israel? I can't learn Hebrew found that out when I was very young, Hebrew school. Uh-huh. Me too. So, no muscle, the young muscle, man. And then you went and had a lifetime of adventures, which and, I've seen you give hour-long presentations about. Yeah, no, then I got lucky and it worked. And I started to shoot a lot of land stories, too make a lot more money on land. And you would do stuff that looked pretty risky. Always make it look like sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I mean, do sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Make it look dangerous, but make sure it's safe. Uh -huh. And so when I've asked you what, if there were any scary times, you mentioned once when a some kind of sharp, thin fish cut open your wetsuit once? Well, maybe the dangerous time was when I almost got killed up in Lebanon. What happened there? Uh, 1982, the war broke out in Lebanon. And very soon after, Israel pushed up to Beirut. And I went in with a group of journalists, and we came out too late. The rule was you can go in, in the morning, but you should come out by sundown. Uh -huh. And um, we got ambushed. I never heard the story. Yeah. We were behind a bus full of soldiers. Uh -huh. um, and we had like uh, armored personnel carriers in the, there was maybe five vehicles. And uh, we stayed too long in Beirut, which oh, we had a wonderful time. <laughs> and uh, what were you? What were you doing in Beirut? I was doing a story for Life magazine um, uh, about uh, Lebanon, about the war in Beirut, 
and I was first doing uh, West Beirut, and then I was supposed to go to Crete and fly in and do East Beirut, the Muslim side. And uh, I had never done war before. Anyway, uh, sundown, we should have been out soon. Uh, we're traveling in this convoy, and we get ambushed both sides, automatic weapons sprayed all over the place. RPG goes right through one window and out the other in the bus with the soldiers. Well, they immediately got out and responded. But I was crawled into the gutter beside the road, uh -huh. you know, like the drainage ditch, with uh, dirt spitting up around me from the bullets. It was, I, I felt my heart. And I remember what went through my mind was, Oh my God, $350 a day. <laughs> that was my day rate for Life Magazine. Uh -huh. It was a big story, uh -huh. you know. Beirut, the shattered city. Because this war just broke out. And uh, they had... Uh, um, what's his face there? Arafat was surrounded in Beirut. They let him go, but they had him. Everyone said they should have gotten him in. And then the soldiers cleared the ambush and you got back in your bus and kept going? Yeah. And then I was living in Jerusalem at the time and I got back and I was I was in shadows. Yeah. I I said I can't I can't I couldn't go back up there. Uh -huh. Um and I called up uh, this friend of mine who was the assistant picture editor at Life and because the picture editor was on vacation. You have to understand, an assignment like this, a potential cover story for life, mm -hmm. it's huge for a, for a photographer. In those days, a photojournalist. And um, I said, Mel, uh, thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity. But I almost got killed today. I, I'm, I'm really not the right person for this. So, do you remember the time when you said something sliced through your wetsuit? I remember the story uh, was "Don't tell Rainy." I had a surgeon fish cut through my right into my thigh. I had to. So you were bleeding underwater. We had a sailboat, a Bedouin fishing boat, a uh -huh. sail. Like eight hours from shore, we're out diving on an island. And it was a deep cut. Oh, I needed a lot of stitches. So what happened there? Someone the wetsuit held together, but if you opened it up, it went right down. Okay. Yeah. And then I remember you telling me about the time when a Riptide took you, and I think it was Umbi figured out when you didn't come back to the boat what happened. Yeah. He went and found you? He picked me up. I was on my way to Saudi. <laughs> you were struggling against it and you tired No, yourself you can't out. struggle against it. You can't fight it. The current's too strong. You were just going. And it was Umbi who came after you? Figured mm -hmm. out? No. Yeah. yeah. Picked me up. Were those I don't know, your most dangerous experiences? Your most you had a lot of interesting experiences. You've been Yeah, I think oh, being in El Salvador with uh, my friend who sells arms and security. Leo. Yeah. In the um when was it eighty six? In the middle of the Civil War. That was because he was a target. And we were staying in safe houses. Uh-huh. And uh, we had, uh, like when we drive in the Jeep, we'd have guns pointed out in every direction. Automatic weapons and machine guns and shit. Do you know how to shoot a gun? No. I mean, yes, but I hate guns. Can't stand them. Did you ever train with guns at all? No. Not really. So a little bit. A little bit. 
and you know judo. You studied judo. Yeah. You said Leo slept with a gun under his pillow during that trip. Oh yeah, of course. And you would leave the safe house at different times so people couldn't see you were together? Yeah, we would walk on opposite sides of the street. So they couldn't get two targets. They could only get one of us, I guess. That's the way I, I understood it. Walk together, they get you. And then you uh, lived with a, can a tribe of cannibals in Africa for a while. Is that true? Uh -uh. I get a um, story in uh, the Amazon. Uh, they were cannibals. They had uh, ritualistically killed two nuns and then dug them up later and ate parts of their heart or something. That didn't feel something. actually dangerous to you? No. And, um, uh, I did a tribe in Africa that was hunting Nile crocodiles and hippopotamus with spears back in the uh, early 80s in Kenya in a very remote area called Lake Turkana. And that was kind of exciting. I spent a month up there with him. Uh -huh. And uh, witnessed some pretty, pretty strong stuff. Like what? Well, they would uh, hunt these gigantic Nile crocodiles. Uh, by walking into the water. Lake Turkana had the largest population of Nile crocodiles in the world. And some of these guys would grow over 15 feet. And then at night, when the hippos would come out onto the banks of this giant lake to feed on the grasses, they would hunt as a group with these um, big, big spears that had ropes attached to them. And the spearhead would detach from the spear itself, stuck into the hide of the hippo. And they'd be left holding the rope attached to the spearhead. And then one man would uh, approach it and spear it with his uh, with a traditional long spear. So it was an interesting trip for me. Very interesting. I had to bring all my own. You know, there was no gas station up there. I had to bring 50-gallon drums of gas in a Land Rover that I rented in uh, Nairobi. I got this idea from a book someone gave me to do this story. So, so. you would you would assign your stories to yourself? Oh, oh from yourself. the beginning, yeah. I would accept assignments if they were interesting, but um, if they weren't, I, I would say, geez, I'm just not the right photographer, I think, for this story, or thanks a lot, I'm, I'm shooting for someone else during that time, or can you pull over there, I'm going to piss. <laughs>